Well, thanks so much for that uh, long and boring introduction. <laughs> but you didn't mention the most important thing. Which is? And that's, I used to work for the youth service before I was elected to parliament. And I, and I say that not uh, in a trivial way, but, but frankly, that had a, a huge influence on how I approach politics. And uh, I think it's a, it's a real problem in politics that people have to say, you have a, there's a political class, a group of individuals who are almost self-perpetuating. Well, I think we, but we've got to dispense with that, quite honestly. I mean, politics is all about representing people. Right? Real democracy, I think, is, is not about people, men usually, in gray or blue suits, who are middle-aged, telling people what they want. That's old hat. I think the way forward for politics is for people themselves to have the confidence and the wherewithal to be able to articulate their needs in the way they want them. And I think that's, that kind of dem direct democracy is a way that our societies need to evolve in the future. Now, my brief talk is about uh, human rights in Britain. And basically, what I want to say is this. When, when people think of Britain, they think of the government's pronouncements on human rights and David Cameron's very critical comments of the one or two judgments that have been made against the United Kingdom and the view that he has that human rights is all about nasty foreigners telling British people what to do. It's all about Strasbourg enforcing decisions on the United Kingdom. It's all about undermining British sovereignty so that the British people no longer can do what they want to do. That's one attitude. But in the United Kingdom, there's, there's a different attitude. And that's because Britain is no longer the country it once was. And what I mean by this is that Britain has traditionally been one of the most centralized states, not just in Europe, but in the whole of the Western world. Power has rested in one capital city, London. But so long the case, because there are different centers of power in the countries and territories which make up the United Kingdom. For example, what I mean by that is there is Scotland, there's Wales, there's Northern Ireland, as well as England. Together, they make the United Kingdom. Yes, we still have a parliament in London, but also you have a Scottish parliament now. You have a Welsh assembly. You have a Northern Ireland assembly. And increasingly what we're seeing is power is going out from the center to the periphery. So power is becoming more diverse in the United Kingdom. The result is, frankly, you no longer have one single voice from the United Kingdom. You have a number of voices. So what I want to look at very briefly is how those different voices are reflected in the debate about human rights. We all know what the Conservative-led government's view is of human rights. We all know what Mr. Cameron thinks about decisions made in the uh, European Court of Human Rights. To use his words, they make him physically sick. That's what he said. But I'd suggest to you that there's a very, very different attitude in Scotland, in Wales, and in Northern Ireland. And I'll give you a few examples of what I mean. If you look at Northern Ireland, for example, in Northern Ireland, you have one of the most troubled parts of the whole of Europe. People in, in Ireland, in the North especially, have been literally killing each other for hundreds of years. There's been a huge historic divide between the Protestant community and the Catholic community. For the first time in nearly 600 years, we have got peace in Northern Ireland. How has that come about? Well, it's come about because people have been prepared to make compromises. 
because it's been a dialogue between different communities. People have come to realize that the way to achieve peace is not for one side having victory and the other side losing. The way to achieve peace is for people to work together and to make compromises. So nobody is defeated, but at the same time, nobody has, has victory. And one of the reasons why that's been able to happen is because of the European dimension. I used to be a member of the, the European Parliament when it was actually based in this building before it moved across the road. And one of the, the interesting things that used to happen was that every month when Parliament used to move down here from Brussels, sitting on a corner of the, the members' dining room used to be two individuals. One was Ian Paisley, Ian Paisley Senior, and the other was John Hume, who led the Social Democratic and Labour Party. One was a Protestant, the other was a Catholic. In Northern Ireland, you'd see him on television, and he'd be arguing and shouting and calling each other everything. And they couldn't meet together in Northern Ireland or even in London, but they could meet physically in the European Parliament and have a, a meal together and find out there were many things which united them, not just divided them. And in a very physical sense, Europe has provided that space for about rapprochement in Northern Ireland, which is the basis of the peace process. But what's one way in which the European Union has, has helped people come together in Northern Ireland? But there's another way as well. And that's with regard to the, the Council of Europe and the European Convention on Human Rights. Because the most important thing that we've seen in Ireland for many, many years is the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. That was the agreement bitterly opposed by some extremists still, which actually has provided a basis for what so far is a lasting peace. And that agreement is based essentially on the values which emanate from the European Convention on Human Rights. It is actually central to that Good Friday Agreement. And that agreement brings together Protestants and Catholic, the British state and the Republic of Ireland, and it recognizes fundamentally the rights of minorities. And if there's a root cause for the conflict in Northern Ireland, it was a feeling that the Catholics were excluded from civil society by the Protestant majority. And because the Good Friday Agreement, accepted right across the political spectrum, has in, enshrined that basic respect we have lasting peace, I hope, in Northern Ireland. But in Northern Ireland too, as I said earlier, you have an assembly established, the Northern Ireland Assembly. And there you have power sharing between the two communities. And also in that assembly, you have proportional representation, so people are elected on a, a different basis to many other parts of the United Kingdom. And also in that assembly, you have people coming together and realizing that they have more things in common than they have which divide them. And human rights is one issue in particular. Now we see in, in Northern Ireland that Britain has a new voice with insight, its ranks. But of course, devolution doesn't just relate to Northern Ireland. We also see devolution occurring in Wales as well. And I'm very pleased my, my colleague, Elwyd Lloyd is here, who is the parliamentary leader of Plaid Cymru, the Welsh Nationalist Party. And uh, I hope very much he agrees me when I say this. I think one of the, the, the great developments in the British state has been the success of devolution in terms of the initial referendum saw a very, very small majority in favour of devolution. But as it's been established, it has grown and become more and more popular. And we saw in 2011, the National Assembly for Wales having lawmaking powers 
for the first time. Again, the people voted for it, this time by a huge majority. Right? And in interestingly, too, the Welsh Assembly is firmly committed to human rights. It is interesting that the British government, Conservative-led, has had a review into whether or not uh, Britain should continue with the European Convention of Human Rights. And there was a lot of talk at, uh, at one time a few years ago about having a Bill of Rights instead. So at great expense, the British government set up this inquiry. And the Commission went around different parts of the United Kingdom and they came to Wales. And they interviewed members of the Welsh Assembly. And in the report, they actually say that he was speaking to a Conservative member of the Welsh Assembly. And he said, well, you would expect me as a Conservative to say, I'm against the European Convention on Human Rights, and it should be done away with. He says, well, I suppose I've got to say that. I'm a Conservative. But I don't really believe in it, because most of my colleagues in Wales, we actually think it's a good thing. It, and it underpins our democracy here in Wales. And what we want to see, really, is it being extended, not diminished. And one of the clearest examples of how those universal rights have been very effective in Wales is with regard to the policies which have been developed for older people and the policies which have been developed for young people as well. They've embraced, for example, the United Nations uh, Charter on the Rights of the Child. And we've seen a whole range of policies right across the board affecting young people in a very, very positive way. There's even a forum established called Funky Dragon, which is made up of young people born from all different parts of Wales in which they give their views, not just on youth policies, but on a whole range of different policies as they impact upon young people. And that has helped to change the culture of politics, which I mentioned earlier, so that it's not just the politicians in the assembly who make the decisions on behalf of others and tell them what to do. It's young people and others in the community who are involved in the decision-making process as well. And therefore, there's a kind of grassroots ownership which has given a, a new impetus to democracy. The final thing I'd mention is Scotland. Scotland has got its, its parliament once again because it did have a historic parliament until 1707, when Scotland was united with, with England. Now there's a, a Scottish parliament, and the debate is not whether or not devolution shall be stopped. The, the debate in Scotland today is whether or not devolution should be taken forward, or whether or not it should be taken further still, and Scotland should have independence from the British state. And one of the reasons why the debate about Scottish assertiveness has developed as it has done. It's because the people of Scotland have different opinions to the London-based government. Particularly, it has to be said, on the issue of human rights. There's no question at all of human rights being undermined in Scotland, like in Wales or Northern Ireland. It's only in London, with a conservative government, that we have that debate. In fact, the Scottish Parliament has led the way, really, in bringing together civil society and trade unions and local authorities and business people and others to actually have a declaration strongly supporting human rights, and that pervades their policies as well. Now, what I want to conclude with you is this. Cross, uh, politics is all about making choices. And it's a bit of a cliche, I know, but in many ways, Britain, I think, is, is at a crossroads. Because we've got a, a referendum taking place in uh, Scotland on whether they should be part of the Union. My guess is, Elvin might disagree with me, I think they will probably remain part of the United Kingdom. But the big question is, what sort of government there will be in the United Kingdom in next year's general election? Right? If there is a conservative government, the differences and the tensions which I've talked about 
will become more and more acute. I think that people in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland will increasingly see themselves removed from a kind of politics which is anti-human rights, which they no longer relate to in London. But to be honest with you, I don't think that will happen. Because I think in next year's general election, the people of Britain will vote for a more progressive government, a Labour government, and that government will follow the good example of the peripheral countries of Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So that we'll have a different kind of unity in the United Kingdom, this time based on human rights. Thank you.